Hey, Tiffany, you got it. It's um, recording. But you're on mute. <laughs> Thank you so much. I was trying to figure that out, but as long as it's recording, that's awesome. Thank you. All right. Um, thank you so much, Ella. I appreciate it. All right. So, without further ado, we're going to go over a little bit of basics of the heart, and then we're going to get into some issues. So the first thing we're going to talk about is blood pressure. So what is going on with blood pressure? When we're looking at a blood pressure reading, we're looking at systole versus diastole. So in systole, this is our squeeze. So think systole, think squeeze. The heart is initiating that first squeeze and it's pumping out all of that oxygen rich blood to the body. OK, this is our um, recording that's going to be on the top. So whenever you think systole, think squeeze. The heart is contracting. The heart is de literally delivering that blood to the body. Now, when we're talking about diastole, we are talking about our relaxation and refilling. This is our bottom number. So in order for the heart to effectively squeeze lots of blood out throughout the body, it needs to fill up. So um, when we look at our diastolic blood pressure, this is kind of going to give us a good idea of how much blood is actually going to be able to pool in the heart that we can then go ahead and deliver out to the body. So just very basic concepts, but just when you ever think systole, think squeeze. And diastole, that's kind of our resting, relaxing, refilling. So. When we're talking about depolarization, this is when that electrical activity and the muscle cells of the heart kind of initiates that initial spark. I know this slide's got a lot of information, but I just want you to remember that when we have depolarization, we're initiating that electrical current. So this is what's most going to be seen in our P wave. If you ever see the PQRST complex, we talk a lot more about this in Complex Health 1, but it's a good kind of basic understanding. Repolarization, this is kind of when we deact, um, deact, it's the <laughs> deactivation of the muscle cells. And again, it's kind of when we have the depole, it's kind of going throughout, and then repole, it's kind of getting ready to reset. So just kind of keep those concepts in mind. You might have, it got a little bit cut off, but you might have heard the phrase, send a big bounding pulse. That's going to be the uh, um, kind of method of electrical activity. So the electrical activity starts all the way up on the SA nodes. So we have the SA nodes, and then we're going to kind of go down. We're going to go to like our um, bundle branches, bundle fibers, all the way down to the Perkinie fibers. Um, so that's just kind of a good way to know the electrical activity starts in the top, and it kind of moves its way down. And this is what's going to help initiate that contraction, that systole, diastole. It's all about electrical activation. The reason I bring up is electrical uh, the reason I bring up electrical activity is because a lot of our ions, such as sodium, potassium, magnesium, calcium, they all kind of interact with this concept of electrical activity. So when we talk about interpreting these um, EKG waves, it's not super important to know exactly everything. I just want to kind of get you guys a little bit comfortable with some of these concepts. Um, when we talk about the P wave, this is our atrial depolarization. So remember kind of the atria are kind of initiating that squeeze at the top. So it goes atria down to the ventricles. So during our P wave, this is going to be our atrial depolarization. Remember, it's kind of moving top to bottom. This electrical current is moving top to bottom. So think about it. Our top is our atria and our bottom is going to be our ventricles. So during that first wave, that's the atria, that QRS complex, just that electrical current moving down to the ventricles. When we finish that QRS complex, as we're kind of going through the ST wave, that's like our resting phase. What's our resting? Repolarization. 
So just to kind of help out with that a little bit. The concepts of preload and afterload are really important when we start talking about any sort of stenosis or stiffening issues with heart failure. Um, when we have preload, this is how much blood is in the ventricles at the end of diastole. So what is diastole? Diastole is filling. So we are filling up the ventricles so that we can push the ventricles into the um, heart so that we can kind of get it out through the body. Um, so remember, our ventricles, they're at the bottom. They're going to be what's kind of sending that blood out to the body. So with preload, how much blood is filling in my ventricles before my ventricles go and send it out to the body? So this is our preload. Um, in hypervolemia, that's when we have a lot of fluid overload. Well, fluid overload will increase our blood pressure. If I have a lot of excess fluid, that's going to increase my preload because I just have a lot more stuff I got to push through the ventricles. Our afterload is the resistance it must overcome to circulate blood. So when you think afterload, how much force does it take for me to shoot this blood out through the body? So with our heart failure, stiffening of the ventricles, any sort of damage to the heart, it might be really hard for my heart to really just kind of squeeze all that blood out. And what does that do? It impairs circulation. So those are just your concepts of preload and afterload. Dysrhythmias. So when you think dysrhythmia, think different. So this is a different or abnormal heartbeat. It's still a heartbeat, it's just a little bit different. It's not going to look like your traditional PQRST complex. Again, we go over the exact perfect numbers of your PQRS complex, how many boxes of space, all of that when you get to complex health one. Just understand the basics of dysrhythmias. There's a difference between a dysrhythmia and an arrhythmia. So when we think arrhythmia, think absence absence of a heartbeat. So your asystole is a arrhythmia, whereas our dysrhythmias, they're just a little bit different. If someone has sinus tachycardia, if their heart rate's 180, still a heart rate, it's just different than our normal findings. Same thing with our bradycardia. So just kind of keep that in mind. So we talked a little bit earlier about the electrical conductivity of the heart. So when all is well, we've got great conduction, but our sodium, potassium, magnesium, chloride, all of these electrolytes can mess with the heart. Specifically, pay attention to sodium and potassium. These are gonna be our most life-threatening issues. We talked a lot about hypo and hyperkalemia, and I always said, if there's any potassium imbalance, my heart is not okay. Well, this is why. It's because all of those, you know, um, when you look on the periodic table, they kind of have plus, minus, electrons. It kind of goes back to that basic chemistry. But with our potassium, it's an elect electrolyte. Um, sodium, electrolyte. So think it, it's messing with that electrical activity of the heart. So if I have any differences, if I'm hypo or hyper, it's going to irritate my heart a lot. Specifically with potassium, in instances of hyperkalemia, it irritates the Perkin fibers so much, it causes absolute electrical chaos. And when we have electrical chaos, we can't function properly. Just kind of review, um, sodium can affect it, specifically potassium, magnesium, calcium chloride. Um, a little hint for when we do pathophysiology, we give calcium channel blockers. Why do we do that? Well, we're trying to help fix the electrical conductivity. So I included um, this little diagram I made. This is gonna be our blood flow through our heart. Um, remember this, it never goes away. <laughs> when we get into complex health one, I even include this slide in my complex health one cardiac because it's just so important. So whenever we think about the right side of our heart, well, what happens? Deoxygenated blood comes from our body's systemic circulation via our veins. 
So our veins bring deoxygenated blood up into the right side of the heart. Goes through that vena cava. It's now in the right atrium. From the right atrium, it drops down into the right ventricle. Well, ventricles send blood somewhere. There's two ventricles, so we have two places we're sending blood. The right ventricle, it's going to send the blood into my pulmonary artery, where my lungs can go ahead and oxygenate it. After we're in the pulmonary artery, um, it's going to go through the pulmonary vein into the left atrium. Well, now it's oxygenated. Awesome. I have oxygenated blood. That's awesome. But how am I, how am I getting it to the body? I'm still stuck in the heart. So it's going to go through the left atrium, through the um, mitral valve, into the left ventricle. So goes down the ventricle. Well, what do ventricles do? Send them somewhere. So it's going to send our heart, our um, oxygen rich blood out the heart and into the body, into our systemic circulation. So just kind of keep those, those concepts in mind. Pay special attention to where's the blood coming from? Where's the blood going? And is it oxygenated or deoxygenated? That's going to be really important when we talk about pathologies in a minute. Um, another concept, when you think arteries, they carry um, oxygenated blood away. It says, I do have some people in the lobby, so forgive me. I'm just going to uh, let them in really quickly. Um, when we're talking about veins, veins are going to carry deoxygenated blood to the lungs. When we start going into like phlebotomy skills, IV draws, IV sticks, how do you know if you're in a vein or if you're in an artery? Well, if you are in an artery, you're going to feel a pulse. If you're in a vein, you're not going to feel a pulse. It's just because the arteries are sending all that blood away from the heart. It can be a little bit tricky. Just kind of keep that in mind. Again, um, when we talk about our pulmonary vein and our pulmonary arteries, this is what's supplying the actual heart with oxygenated rich blood. Because the heart supplies the whole body with oxygenated blood. But then we have to think about it. Well, well the heart's feeding everyone who, who's feeding the heart. Well, the heart's pretty cool. It does it on its own. So the pulmonary vein is going to take that deoxygenated blood um, and then take it directly to the lungs and then right back to the heart. Awesome. Um, just an important review when we're differentiating left side and the right side. When we talk about heart failure, these symptoms you're gonna be able to kind of memorize and remember these symptoms based on kind of where's it coming from, where's it going. So we're talking about the left side of the heart. Where does the left side of the heart receive blood from? Well, when we think left, think lungs. It gets blood from the lungs. So if I have any issue with the left side of my heart, maybe it's stiff, maybe it's not working, maybe my mitral valve won't open, um, maybe it just won't close with what's going on. Well, I'm going to see a lot of these symptoms. They're going to present as lung symptoms because if the blood is traveling and it hits a roadblock, it's going to cause a complete traffic jam. It's going to get backed up. Well, if it can't go forward, it's just going to go backwards. Where did it come from? The lungs. So where's it going to be pushed back into? It's going to be pushed back into the lungs. Okay. If there happens to be an issue with the right side of my heart, let's say my tricuspid valve is not opening or my right ventricle is so stiff, I can't push blood into my lungs, where's it going to back up into? Well, it's going to back up where it came from. Where did it come from? It came from the body. Therefore, it's going to back up into the body. So if I have any issues with the right side of my heart, I'm going to see those symptoms present in the body, okay? 
just think in mind, um, I think I have it on the next slide, but if we ever have any sort of left-sided heart failure, can actually progress into right-sided heart failure as well, just because the right side of the heart has to work extra hard to kind of compensate for all that blood being pushed back. So I have a little slide on some mnemonics. Um, this is in regards to heart failure. So if my patient is in left-sided heart failure, they're going to have those lung symptoms. Okay, what are my lung symptoms? When we auscultate, I'm going to hear crackles. It's going to be some pulmonary edema. Where there's fluid buildup, I might not hear anything at all. Pink frothy sputum is a big one. Um, when we have nocturnal dyspnea, that shortness of breath when they're trying to sleep. Why is that? Well, they're lying down. Um, restlessness, confusion, um, et cetera. If I'm having right-sided heart failure, where's that blood being pushed back into? It's being pushed back into the body. So what am I going to present with? JVD is a really big one. Um, jugular vein distension. I'm going to see big, big, big bounding veins on my neck. And I have dependent edema, like pitting edema, two plus in the lower extremities. GI issues, because kind of that fluid's backing up into my GI tract. Fatigue, weight gain, they're gonna be pretty bloated as well. Um, for a couple more of my visual learners, I did include some um, photos just to kind of reinforce the concepts. Um, you might also hear right-sided heart failure called core pulmonale. Um, so just kind of keep that in mind. So if you ever see patient has core pulmonale, that's just right-sided heart failure from left-sided heart failure. Because remember, left-sided heart failure almost always leads to right-sided heart failure. The only time in which a patient might have right-sided heart failure um, on their own is if maybe they had an infection of one of the valves in the right side of the heart. Again, another picture. Just pay special attention to our left-sided heart failure. Hint, hint, wink, wink. So I included some cardiovascular equations for you guys because you might see them, especially in the clinical setting when your patients are hooked up to a bunch of things. You're thinking, what in the world is happening? I also included, I know you guys, you might have already had some ATI calculations, um, but sometimes when you're doing like med surge stuff or med surge ATI, you might have some like calculate the MAP questions. So just kind of review how to do that. Um, our mean arterial pressure, this indicates how well we're perfusing my organs. So if I have really bad heart failure and I'm having a hard time sending oxygenated blood out to my, my organs, my organs aren't going to be perfused as well as they should. So if you calculate your patient's MAP and it's maybe 65, we're really concerned kind of gets below 60, we're really concerned that there's going to be some really bad organ damage. So just kind of keep that in mind. Well, it's not super important at this point to know really how to calculate some MAPs. You might have to do it on a quiz or something like that. Um, but just really understand what is the concept of mean arterial pressure. It's how well am I perfusing my organs. I need good organ perfusion in order to feed my organs and help them function accordingly. When we talk about um, pulse pressure, this is my systolic blood pressure minus my diastolic blood pressure. Super easy to kind of figure out, not a lot of math to it, just take your top and subtract it from your bottom. Um, if I have a very uh, low pulse pressure, this is really common in our heart failure. Um, this is when you might see your patient like 90 over 60, um, 90 minus 60, that's going to be 30. And if my patient has a pulse pressure of 30, that is very low, very narrow. Um, I'm having, I'm have, I can kind of assume what's happening. Blood loss, heart failure. You're almost always going to see this in your hype, um, 
in your patients that are maybe in like hypovolemia, hypovolemic shock. Um, so just kind of keep that concept in mind when we're talking about pulse pressure. Um, it's a good thing to kind of take note of in clinical. What's my patient's pulse pressure? Um, pulse pressure can tell you a lot about what's going on. We talked a lot about heart failure. Just know with a heart failure, probably going to have a very low pulse pressure. Um, however, if we have a really high pulse pressure, what if I have a BP of like 150 over like 70? That is like a very large difference between the two numbers. So it's going to indicate a widened pulse pressure. Um, usually you're going to see this in an impending myocardial infarction. Finally, we talked a lot about blood pressure earlier, but it's just the force of blood pushing, pushing against those arteries. Um, ejection fraction is another very interesting concept. Concept. This is the percentage of blood leaving the heart each time it contracts. So ideally, we want about 50 to 70 percent kind of leaving the heart and going out to the body. This is going to help us maintain a really nice map. But if I have a low ejection fraction, that means I'm not getting as much blood out to the body. Well, usually you're going to see that in heart failure. So it's going to be your stroke volume over your end diastolic volume. So kind of keep that in mind. A little advanced, um, but just kind of understand what's the concept of it. Okay. Um, also included a lot more info on our ejection fraction. So if you ever hear like HREF versus HPEF, um, it's our heart failure with a reduced ejection fraction or a heart failure with a preserved ejection fraction. Um, so I might have a heart failure with a, um, sorry, just forgot to like lock the door. So that made me a little bit nervous. Um, that's okay. Um, where was I? Heart failure with reduced. So this is our systolic heart failure. So might be an issue kind of whenever you think systolic. Well, diastole is what's pushing blood out to the body. So if I'm having like diastolic heart failure, I'm going to see that kind of like more issues. Um, but with systolic heart failure, I'm just really not able to send it out to the body. So um, with systolic heart failure, you're going to see a reduced ejection fraction because systole, that's our squeeze, sending blood out to the body. If I'm having an issue with that squeeze, I'm not sending a lot of blood out to the body. So you're going to see that reduced ejection fraction because I'm just sending less blood out. We talked about ejection fraction. Ejection fraction is how much blood am I sending out? Well, if my systole can't squeeze, I'm not delivering a lot of blood. So just kind of very, very basic, very basic understanding. Um, if we have our H uh, PEF, this is our preserved ejection fraction. So I'm having like these symptoms of, of heart failure, um, usually in kind of more of that left side, but I'm, for whatever reason, I'm still maintaining a really nice ejection fraction. So this is what we would classify heart failure with our preserved ejection fraction. So this is more of a stiffening issue, if you will. Um, I also included some ways to calculate cardiac output. Um, so this is how much blood is being pumped out of the ventricles from one minute, multiple different ways to calculate it. Um, but just know it's our heart rate uh, multiplied by our stroke volume. How do we do our stroke volume? That's um, end diastolic volume minus your end systolic volume. But again, that's just a little advanced. I just wanted you guys to um, just have that information um, just in case you guys might want it. Um, I think it's really interesting and really, really helpful in the clinical setting. So that's going to be kind of our cardiac overview. Now we're going to get into our disease processes. So um, without further ado, let's begin. So um, 
we have myocardial ischemia versus our myocardial infarction. So when you think infarction, think death. When you think ischemia, think just lack of oxygen, okay? Usually when we see our myocardial ischemia, they've had a brief uh, loss of oxygen, um, but usually it does return. So it's not enough of a loss to actually cause death. A myocardial infarction occurs when we have a sustained amount of uh, inadequate oxygen that eventually leads to death and necrosis. Um, if you've ever heard of our stable angina, maybe our patient has chest pain on exertion, but after they stopped, you know, exerting themselves, it's, you know, they're not in pain anymore. That's going to be more of our ischemia. Um, when we talk about our myocardial infarction, though, again, that's that sustained lack of oxygen. So usually um, uncorrected ischemia is going to lead to myocardial infarction. Why is this? Our number one cause of myocardial ischemia is the buildup of plaques in our coronary arteries. So as plaques build up, my coronary arteries kind of get more narrow and narrow and narrow and narrow. Well, what do the coronary arteries do? They supply the heart with oxygen-rich blood. If I had a boba straw, and now it's that little tiny coffee stir straw. Think about trying to push air through it. Not as effective. So just um, keep that concept in mind. Um, when we talk about our chronic venous insufficiency, this is what's going to be our circulatory stasis. Um, when we get into uh, Virchow's triad, we'll talk a little bit more about this. But there's a couple of different types of chronic venous insufficiency. When you think about this, all it's saying is I'm having some venous insufficiency. My veins, what do they do? They bring deoxygenated blood up into the heart to become oxygenated. But if I'm having some venous insufficiency, I'm having a hard time taking my blood from the veins and put it in the heart. Um, so you might see a variety of different types of chronic venous insufficiency. Usually our varicose veins um, are kind of a subcategory of this. But usually just think with the symptoms. Um, what are symptoms of blood that's pooling? Well, usually via gravity, they're going to pool in the lower extremities. So I'm probably going to have these venous stasis ulcers, skin color and texture changes. I have a lot of warm blood that's kind of sitting there, probably going to be a little bit swollen, probably a little bit reddened, sw swelling, erythema, all the above. Um, again, in the beginning, we talked a lot about blood pressure. So what is hypertension? This is when I have um, blood pressure that is above our normal limits. Um, again, this slide has wonderful information for you guys. Not necessary to memorize every single piece of it, but I just kind of want you to know that when we have, you know, an elevated blood pressure, that's fine. Um, it can happen when you're in the hospital. People might get a little anxious. Um, now, when we start seeing the stage one, the stage two, we're concerned, especially if we see a constant trend on more than two readings. Our most life-threatening condition is our hypertensive crisis, because at this point, the heart is working overload, and we're not going to be able to keep up with this demand. And if your patient is in a hypertensive crisis, we don't kind of treat that, they're going to decline pretty, pretty rapidly. Um... Lots of factors contribute to hypertension. Our main one is going to be dietary, specifically cholesterol. So whenever we're educating on hypertension, we really want to talk about making sure that with our total cholesterol, we're keeping it less than 200. Our triglycerides, we're keeping it less than 150. LDLs, less than 100. Our HDL, that's our good, our happy cholesterol. So obviously we want more of that. Um, but our number one kind of treatment for hypertension is lifestyle changes. Um, if lifestyle changes don't work, that's when we're going to choose to medicate. Um, so just keep that in mind. What are our high cholesterol foods, fatty meats, cheeses, 
um, chips, all that kind of quote unquote junk food. Um, I included a little bit of a blurb on BNP, um, but if you suspect your patient is, you know, hypertensive, but maybe we don't have a full history, we can look at their BNP. All I want you guys to be aware of BNP is that BNP tells us, is stretching going on? If my heart is constantly having to, you know, have this elevated blood pressure, that's putting a lot of stress and stretching on the ventricles because my ventricles have to push it out with a lot more force. Um, so just think repeated force, a lot of stretching going on. So I just want you to understand that, that concept because it's really going to be beneficial in the long run. Again, um, knowing your College of Nursing lab values is important. I know that they now put um, like your um, like CBC lab values or your um, electrolyte panel lab values on your exams, but I'm not sure if they will put vi like normal vital ranges. Um, at least for me, I've never seen, you know, the normal vital ranges for heart rate, blood pressure, anything like that, O2 sats, whatever. Um, so just, I want you to kind of remember what your vital lab values are, because I don't think that those will be provided on the NCLEX or exams. Um, your labs, yes, but these are vital. It's a little bit different. Just kind of review that. Um, main risk factors, alcohol, smoking, diet, et cetera. Obviously, you can see there's so many complications of hypertension, so it's really important to make sure that we assist our patient in effectively managing this. So coronary artery disease, what's happening? I drew this cute little picture for you guys, um, but essentially lipids from fats and cholesterol end up building up in our coronary arteries. So as you can see, we have a lot less blood getting, you know, back to the heart. Well, What's the problem with this? Our red blood cells, our blood carries oxygen. So if I'm not given, getting enough blood to an area, I'm therefore not getting enough oxygen to an area. So just kind of keep that in mind. Usually high cholesterol diets, obesity, smoking are really big risk factors in this. Um, atherosclerosis, that's going to be just our um, plaque buildup in the arteries. Um, and again, we have we have arteries everywhere. We have femoral arteries, carotid arteries, etc. Um, so that's another concept to kind of keep in consideration. But really, our main concern: reduced blood flow and clots. What happens when these big, thick, sticky, yucky plaques burst and kind of go into little smaller pieces? Um, clot. Yeah. So what in the world is angina? We've heard about it all the time. All angina means is chest pain. If my patient's having angina, they are having chest pain. As nurses, we need to be the ones to assess this angina, to assess this chest pain, to see what in the world is happening. Um, therefore, if we figure out what's happening, we can figure out how to treat it. Um, so why does the heart hurt all of a sudden? Well, it's like an innate response from the heart. So when the heart receives inadequate oxygenation, it's going to release a little bit of pain. As soon as it receives that inadequate oxygenation, it's going to kind of send out some pain signals. That's a heart kind of calling for help, if you will. When we have stable angina, this occurs during an activity and will be relieved with rest or nitroglycerin tablets. You haven't learned about nitroglycerin tablets yet, so just kind of know it occurs during activity and it's relieved with rest. So maybe my patients had a history of coronary artery disease and they went running and they ran super, super fast, super, super quick. That's, you know a lot of myocardial demand. My heart's therefore going to beat faster. But if I have really narrow arteries, just because my heart is you know, stressed out because I ran, well, I still have that limited blood flow. So for a little bit of time, my oxygen needs might not be met. So just kind of keep that into consideration that angina isn't always indicative of a heart attack. 
and it's relieved with rest and nitro. This is just our myocardial ischemia that we talked about. When we get concerned is when we have this unstable angina. So this occurs even at rest. So maybe my patient um, was out shoveling snow, for those of you that are up north, um, was shoveling snow and came in and just had severe chest pain. You know, he went to his bedroom, he took his nitroglycerin medication, he sat down. After five minutes, he's still in a lot of pain. He takes another med. It's not working. So he calls 911, the ambulance shows up, comes to, you know, the ED, they diagnose him with a STEMI. This is our myocardial infarction. So whenever someone's having unstable angina, this is when we're talking about myocardial infarction. And overall, the only treatment for myocardial infarction is to take this patient to the cath lab where they can actually open up that occluded artery. So um, if you ever end up caring for a patient um, that's experiencing a myocardial infarction, ideally we have a one hour time limit. From the time they come into the doors of the hospital, we need them within that hour, we need to assess, prep, all of that, get them up to interventional radiology where they can have that, that artery opened up and that plaque kind of opened up via stent, whatever. Um, because really you have an hour before that irreversible tissue death kind of occurs and becomes a really, really big issue. So let's talk about uh, Virchow's triad. When we're talking about venous thrombosis, we're talking about our blood clot. What's our main concern for blood clots? If I have a blood clot in my arm, in my leg, wherever, I'm really concerned for pulmonary embolism. For whatever reason, the lungs also are a lot, they have a lot more, you know, skinny veins, branches, et cetera. But blood clots or any sort of thrombus loves to lodge in the lungs. Um, so if I have a blood clot anywhere in my body, I'm concerned that if that blood clot becomes mobile again and it starts moving, well, it's going to get stuck somewhere and it's probably going to be the lungs. So just kind of keep that in mind. So what puts my patient at risk for blood clots? We have what's called our triad. So it's kind of your trifecta. You have your hypercoagulable state. Think increased blood, increased red blood cells, increased thickness, increased viscosity. Well, trauma, surgery, our, nat our body's natural response to a cut is to kind of increase blood flow to an area. Well, if I'm increasing blood flow to an area, I'm increasing those clotting factors, everything. So that's putting me at risk for clots. Malignancies such as polycythemia vera, where it just produces like really big, really, really thick red blood cells, that's going to increase viscosity. Um, sepsis is also another one. Um, don't spend too much time on it. I'm not sure if you guys have learned about sepsis yet, but that kind of goes hand in hand is when someone is septic, they're going to use up all their clotting factors really quickly. Um, endothelial wall injury. This is just simple trauma to any really part of the vascular system. Any patient in the hospital is at risk for VTE. This is why a lot of your patients receive VTE prophylaxis, whether it be a Lovenox shot in their tummy or an oral pill. This is because almost all your patients have an IV. Almost all your patients will either have an IV or require an AccuCheck. That's creating trauma, so just keep that in mind. Um, and finally, circulatory stasis. Obviously, even if we can get our patients moving in the hospital, they're not moving as much as they usually do on a day-to-day -day basis. Whether they're bedbound, unconscious, not up to chair, not getting active, they're at risk for clots. This is why usually every two hours, we wanna be moving our patients, whether it be from their bed just to their chair, the bedside commode, anything we can, we want to help them, them move. Um, I had little Miss Mima today at the hospital and we just, all we did was two laps. We did two laps around the hospital and their charge nurse had a bucket of candy and, you know, it was, we, we, we trick-or-treated a little bit late, but we trick-or-treated and it was a fun time. Um, but really getting them mobile is going to be our number one, you know, prevention for um, making sure a patient doesn't get a VTE. 
So our DVTs, our deep vein thrombosis. These usually occur in the leg if my patient has a blood clot in the leg. So usually you're going to see that swelling, pain, and decreased pulses distal to the clot. So you're going to have a lot of swelling, a lot of pain because there's a clot. What's clot doing? It's preventing blood flow. Blood's going to get stuck. It's going to get backed up. It's going to be swollen. It's going to be painful. It's not going to be fun. Body's just not, not having a fun time. You're going to feel pul decreased pulses distal to the clot because my clot is preventing a lot of blood flow. Blood flow is going to create that pulse. Um, so just kind of a concept. Mainly as nurses, what we want to do is if we notice my patient has a DVT, we don't want to touch it. We don't want to massage it. We don't want to do anything. Do not touch it. Probably going to start your patient on some throm um, thrombolytics, some sort of med to kind of help break up the clot, might give them a clot buster or something. Um, but why don't we want to massage the area? We don't want to loosen the clot. Why? It's probably going to continue to travel and it's going to lodge in the lungs. So just kind of really keep that in mind, specifically your symptoms and your nursing considerations. Last but not least, we're going to talk about some of the most common um, pediatric cardiovascular alterations. So um, our most common is going to be our VSD, our ventricular septal defect. Um, I drew this little picture for you guys, and I highlighted kind of what's going on. Um, so there's essentially a hole in the wall of the septum. This causes my oxygenated blood to be mixed with deoxygenated blood. Um, just because it's a structural issue. Our signs and symptoms, you're going to kind of hear murmur, grunting during um, feeds. Um, usually they don't present with too many signs and symptoms, but they might have some increased pulmonary blood flow. Why? Because that blood from the um, left side of the heart is getting pushed back into the right side of the heart. Well, see, it's in the ventricles. So if I push blood from my left ventricle through the hole into the right ventricle, well, what does the right ventricle do? It, it puts the, the blood into the lungs. So that's just putting a lot of extra blood into my lungs and a lot of extra pressure on my lungs. So this is why usually these patients will present with that pulmonary hypertension or some of our pulmonary symptoms. And this is just because it's putting some extra stress on my lungs. So that's what we want to really monitor and, and keep our eye on. Up next, we have our tetralogy of Fallot. Um, when you think tetra, think four. There are four heart defects going on in these patients. Number one is our pulmonary stenosis. Um, what does our pulmonary valve do? It takes blood from the right ventricle to the pulmonary artery to become oxygenated. If that pulmonary valve is super stiff, it can't effectively, it, it just requires a lot of extra work to, to get to the lungs. Talk about right ventricular hypertrophy. My right ventricle is really, really stiff. What does my right ventricle do? It um, sends it again to that to the to the lungs. So again, now we're really not getting getting blood flow to the lungs. Um, overriding aorta, um, the aorta ends up kind of straddling the ventricular septal defect. So again, we're kind of crushing that that area. And then finally, that ventricular septal defect that we previously talked about, um, that's present too. So just think, this is putting a lot of stress on the pulmonary side of things. Um, these patients are going to present cyanotic. Why? Because they're having decreased oxygenation. Why? A lot of lung issues. Um, specifically with oxygenating the blood in the lungs. So they're going to have tet spells. You're going to see cyanosis, and they're going to have hypoxemia. Um, the patient will actually sat at 65 to 85%. Um, however, these kiddos have come to figure out that if they sit themselves in the tripod position or put their knees up to the chest, it kind of deplaces that overriding aorta and it kind of makes them a little bit more comfy and it improves breathing and blood flow. So you might see your patient satting at about 70. You put them in this position, 
take some deep breaths, you're going to see their O2 sets begin to rise. They're going to also have clubbed fingers. This is just from chronic hypoxemia and just a chronic finding. Um, if you ever see like clubbed fingernails, it's not because something happened super quickly. It, it occurs over time. Um, they're also going to have polycythemia. This is because they have increased hemoglobin and hematocrit. Because of that hypoxemia, the body's really good. It wants to adapt as best as it can. So if I am constantly not receiving enough oxygen, my body's going to produce a little bit uh, more hemoglobin simply to try to incre increase the oxygen carrying capacity. Um, again, acute cyanosis at birth is a big one. Difficult feeding and poor growth, um, pretty common. Bear with me, these drawings aren't the best, but I, I did try. Um, when we talk about our coarctation of the aorta, this is our narrowing of the aorta. Um, and what does our aorta do? It sends blood away from the heart out to the body. So if my aorta is really narrow, it's going to impede blood flow out to the body. Um, with this one, we see some, some different signs and symptoms, specifically when we differentiate the upper extremities and the lower extremities. So if I take a blood pressure in their arm, they're going to have really high blood pressure and some bounding pulses. But if I take a blood pressure on their leg, I'm going to see some low blood pressure, cool temperature, and pain. So just kind of um, keep in mind some, some issues that, that might evolve from this. Um, but again, the body tries to adapt, um, resulting in left ventricular hypertrophy. And that is all I have for you guys. Um, if you have any questions, please let me know. I'll stay on for a little bit. I hope that this was helpful and that you guys did benefit from this. And if you guys could provide any sort of feedback, that would be very much appreciated. Um, but I kind of liked this style of kind of going through an organ system because I think it kind of really puts everything into perspective and it allows us to really dive deep into such a complex system and kind of make it a little bit easier. But if you have any questions, please put them in the chat. You can unmute yourselves, anything at all. So you can find the other reviews. I have a YouTube channel that I put all of my reviews on. Um, after this meeting, I will email you guys the link to this review. Um, and it'll all just be on the same channel. I created a playlist specifically for pathophysiology. Um, so if you just kind of wanted to go through that. But if you're looking for renal and respiratory, that will also be um, in my patho playlist. <laughs>